Thank you. Um, so I'm going to be uh, talking about protecting host systems from imperfect accelerators. Um, so we all know that accelerators are pretty much everywhere. Uh, every conference you look at, there's a bunch of new papers, and that doesn't even count all the GPGPU papers, which are also, of course, accelerators. So the question we're interested in is, you know, what if accelerators are imperfect? And accelerators can be imperfect due to bugs, of course, uh, but also increasingly due to the potential for malicious design. So you buy a third-party IP, how do you know that it actually, you know, is not ha does not have malicious uh, uh, code in it or, or uh, hardware in it? Okay, so what we would like to do is, is protect ourselves uh, from such accelerators. Um, and so we're going to focus uh, on a class of accelerators that share a unified virtual memory with the host, as well as a unified physical memory of the host. So you can think of like a closely integrated GPU or increasingly closely coupled accelerators. We're also going to consider accelerators that may participate in the coherence protocol because, because of course, uh, physical memory is coherent these days. Okay, but we're also going to assume that these are less trusted, okay, either because they haven't been verified to the same extent as the CPU or that they're done by, implemented by a third party. Um, and so, of course, if they have access to all of memory, uh, they, if they're compromised, they can affect all of host memory, not just the processes that are running on the accelerator. Okay, now we've done a bunch of work. This work is mostly done with my colleagues uh, Mark Hill and uh, his student Lena Olson. Uh, and so she has a whole class of, of accelerator threats. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to talk about two today, which focus on, on memory. The first is accesses to invalid addresses, so wild writes or reads to sensitive data, which together allow effective full access to the entire uh, host system. And I'm going to talk about a solution that uh, uh, we came up with called border control. Uh, the second threat is incorrect implementations of the coherence protocol. So if you, know, if you generate incorrect messages, what happens? Deadlocks can happen, denial of service attacks can happen, lots of bad stuff can happen. And so we have a solution to that threat called crossing guard. And so I'm going to talk at pretty high level and pretty quickly about both of these. So you'll get a flavor of them, but not all the details. Okay, so the first one, uh, border control, is really talking about sandboxing that an accelerator. And so this work was presented at Micro a couple of years ago uh, and was co-authored by uh, Jason Lopower, who is around here somewhere, maybe, uh, at, the, at this uh, summit in any case. Um, so the threat model here is to protect the host from an incorrect or malicious accelerator that could perform stray reads, which have the potential to uh, violate confidentiality, and st or stray writes, which can violate integrity. Um, and, and in particular, it's a threat for both processes that run on the accelerator or not on the accelerator, including the operating system itself. Okay, so which accesses are stray is really the key question. Um, and so we go back to Jerome Salser, who about 40 years ago said, you know, define the principle of least privilege, which says that every program and every user of the system should operate using the least set of privileges necessary to complete the job. Primarily, this principle limits the damage that can result from an accident or error. Okay, so we modify this slightly and say every hardware accelerator should satisfy this principle of least privilege. So how does that apply to accelerators? Well, obviously, we should not have access an accelerator should not have access to the OS or to sensitive data from other processes. It should have access to just what it needs. Okay, now who defines that? Well, in conventional systems, that's def uh, determined by the operating system or a hypervisor um, and uses the page table. So that's what we're going to do is assume that the page table information is defining the set of uh, pages that we should have access to. So if we look at our sample system here, we have the trusted zone, which is outlined in, should be green, uh, looks like puce yellow here, but the CPU and the whole CPU memory hierarchy we're assuming is designed by uh, a trusted uh, CPU design team. So that's in green, and there are green data paths because of, those are trusted data paths, and the accelerators are in their own individual red zones. Those are not trusted, and so there are red data paths that connect to that. And so this is an example of an unsafe system because we have unsafe accelerators connecting directly to our shared memory or shared last level cache. So what we want to do is make this be safe and efficient. So to make it uh, safe, we presumably want to put some address translation and some security mechanisms in between the accelerator and the, uh, the memory. Okay, so a conventional way to do this 
is, uh, oops, I'm getting, looking at the wrong screen. Okay, uh, a conventional way to do this is uh, what we call full IOMMU. And so we're gonna interpose a, uh, a IOMMU translation device. Uh, so these were created for, for IO systems. Um, and so the idea here is that every address that's generated by the accelerator will be translated to a physical address before it's passed on to the rest of the memory system and thereby check uh, the page permissions. Okay, and this is, works completely well. You get a completely safe system, uh, but it's completely slow because IOMMUs are neither designed for low latency nor high bandwidth. And so if you, wanna do, if you wanted to run all the translations for an FPG or through a, for a uh, graphics accelerator through your IOMMU, good luck. Okay, so what people do if they want performance is they do what's called bypass uh, IOMMU, which is to say the IOMMU still does the translation, uh, does the page table walks, but we're gonna cache that information in a, a per accelerator TLB. Okay, so what happens uh, in this is we'll see some virtual address issued by the accelerator, look for that in the TLB, if it's not there, we send it on to the IOMMU, translates that to the correct physical address, and then returns that to the TLB, which can now cache that for many accesses to that page. Okay, and so that works great, um, unless of course there's some malicious hardware or a bug, okay? And in the presence of either of those, you know, that P might get trans be corrupted into some address Q, which happens to map to the OS uh, memory uh, image. And so now when the accelerator accesses that virtual address, which translates now to Q, it's going to go access this, what should have been protected memory, okay? And so effectively, we have now tunneled a red uh, data path into our protected green zone, okay? So, so that's not good, that's not safe. So, well, what could we do to fix this? Well, IBM uh, has proposed the, the CAPI and open CAPI-like system, which basically says, hey, we'll design the cache for you, um, and, uh, and so the accelerator is going to access the cache designed by IBM or whoever, okay? And so this works uh, great. Let's see, do I have animations on this? No, uh, it works great except that, well, what's the latency of that cache? What's the bandwidth of that cache? Does my crypto accelerator need the same, you know, cache uh, that a GPU needs, right? It's a one-size-fits-all problem, and guess what? One-size-fits-nobody particularly well. Okay, so it, it's safe, but it's not a good uh, high performance solution. Okay, so if we compare these uh, various schemes, uh, we can ask sort of three questions. Does it support having a TLB and caches? Can those caches be customized? And is it safe? Okay, well, the full IO MMU solution doesn't allow caches, therefore they can't be customized, but it's safe. So that's good, but it's slow. Okay, the bypassable IO MMU uh, allows you to have TLB and caches. So you can customize them to your heart's delight. So your GPU cache can be eight-way banked or, or whatever it needs to be. Um, but of course, it's not safe. Uh, the CAPI-like system says, well, you can have TLBs and caches, but you can't customize them. So they're gonna be kind of slow or at least, you know, or possibly overkill for what you need for a particular accelerator. But it is safe. And what we'd like to do is answer yes to all these questions. And that's the goal of border control. Okay, so what does border control do? Well, we basically start with the IO MMU bypass solution where we have a TLB and a cache which can be customized by the accelerator designer to whatever it is they wanna do, um, but we're gonna add this border control agent who's gonna check every access that comes across the border um, to make sure that it's a safe access. So the way this works is like before, we have a virtual address, we look in the TLB, if that misses, we'll go to the IOMMU, translate it to our green address P. But the IO, at this point, the IOMMU is also going to say, hey, border control agent, here, this P, that's a valid address for you to, to access. And the border control agent is going to remember that. Uh, and we can return P back. And now subsequent accesses to P will come across, and the border control agent can check and say, hey, that's OK. We'll allow this access to go to, to memory, and you're good to go. Okay, if we have a corrupted address Q that comes down to the border control agent, he's gonna check and say, hey, wait a minute, you don't have access, you know, you're off to Gitmo or something. Um, so, uh, so that's the basic idea. So what does border control have to do? Well, I'm not gonna spend time talking about the details of the implementation, but it's really simple. 
Okay, there's one instance of this uh, simple controller. There is, for each accelerator, there is a protection table that stores two bits of state per page, obvious state bits here. It's directly indexed by the physical page number, and it takes a tiny amount of memory because it's two bits per 4K page. Um, and then the border control agent itself has a cache to cache those permissions, and a single cache entry can hold a whole lot of stuff because it's two bits per page. Okay, so if you come back to this comparison again, uh, border controls allows TLBs and caches. It allows them to be customized however the designer wants to, to customize them, and it's completely safe. Okay, so. In summary, for border control, we can block those bad accesses, reads or writes, two bits per 4K page, so teeny amount of space overhead. We do have to check them, so we have to access the border control cache. That border control cache could miss, uh, and so there will be some overhead on cache misses. For some simulation data, which I won't even explain what it comes from, the data, the overheads are quite low. Okay? I'd be happy to talk to you more about you know, the implementation and stuff offline. Okay, so that's border control. So that's dealing with rights to bad addresses, reads and writes to, to addresses that you weren't supposed to have access to. The second thing that we focused on was crossing guard. Um, and really the first, this, the second part comes out of the question of, well, border control sounds great, but what happens if your accelerator doesn't uh, issue a well-formed request or a, provides an ill-formed response to a basic coherence request, okay? And so that's really what, what Crossing Guard is trying to, to deal with. And this appeared in ASPLOS uh, in China last spring. Okay, so the threat model here, so this threat model here is, is what we dealt with in border control. Stray reads can violate confidentiality. Stray writes can violate integrity. And the key thing with incorrect coherence activity is it can violate, availab violate availability. Okay, so you can cause deadlocks, you can cause denial of service. Okay, so the goals for Crossing Guard are to allow accelerators to have customized caches, so you can have a high bandwidth cache for a, a GPU or whatever. Um, we want to have a simple standardized coherence interface for accelerator designers. There are lots of accelerators out there. Do we really want them to have to do a complex coherence protocol and, in fact, do one for every host target that they want to, uh, to, to, to work with? Okay, we'd like to make that easier. Um, and then, of course, we want to pro provide safety for the host system, no unexpected messages, no deadlocks, no denial of service. Okay, so I've talked a little bit already about why we want to customize caches. Let me just say a little bit more. CPU caches have to work with all workloads, you know, so one size kind of has to, to, to fit all. Accelerators is a whole different ballgame, right? If you have a streaming accelerator, well, you might want to have a really fancy streaming, you know, prefetcher and maybe not such a big cache. For GPGPUs, well, you need multiple banks. You might want to relax the coherence between the GPU cores, which is what they do. Okay, yesterday we saw a talk about for graph analytics, you might want a bunch of programmable uh, prefetchers, right? There's lots of reasons why you might want to uh, customize the cache for, um, for an accelerator. Well, why do we want simple interfaces? Well, you know, coherence is hard, okay? Uh, there are a bunch of different systems out there. Uh, each one is different. Um, they have different constraints, and it's a lot of work to make it, uh, to, to design your accelerator to work with each of those. There's already an industrial effort called C6 to try to make it easier for people to design accelerators. So this is evident, we see this as evidence as people care about this problem. Okay, this is a real uh, problem that needs to be solved. Okay, uh, the other reasons are, well, host protocols are generally proprietary. Um, and, you know, there's this whole issue of, well, if I want to do, you know, uh, get access to I Intel's Massive protocol, can I? Right? You know, that's difficult and perhaps expensive. Um, it's also the case that uh, they're really complex. So let's give an example of why they're complex. I know, you know, some of you I know know this. Some of you have probably never seen this. So this is a little piece of a coherence protocol. If you've taken, if you ever look at a textbook, um, of a coherence protocol, you might see something like this or a state you know, diagram version of this where you've got five stable states, those are the letters on the far left column, and then across the top are various uh, events or, or messages uh, that, can, that can occur. So an instruction fetch, a load, a store, and invalidate, you know, some other message types, right? And you always look at this, you say, oh, coherence protocols, they're not so bad, right? 
And the problem with that is that this is only the stable states. Once you add all the transient states and all the other corner case events that occur, you get what we usually refer to as the big scary table. Okay, and so there's lots of work uh, done on trying to verify these things. Dan Soren is very much at the lead of that, um, and this stuff is hard. Okay, so we would like to make it simple. You know, so why ask accelerator designers to say go do this, do it for ARM, do it for Intel, do it for AMD, and so on? Right? We don't want them to have to do that. Okay, what about safety? Well, I'm not going to drive into too much uh, the details here, but you know, basically there's that table is basically codifying a set of actions that the cache controller is supposed to take in response to various messages. Okay, so for example, and th this example shows that the accelerator cache in red over there on the left has the, has the block with address A cached in state I, which means invalid. That means it doesn't have a valid copy. It's not a real copy. So if another cache, say cache 2, makes a request for that block, it really shouldn't do anything, right? But what if it does? What if it says, due to this bug, it says, hey, I've got a copy, here's an ACK, right? What's gonna happen to the system? Well, I'm not entirely sure because it depends on the protocol, right? But I can guarantee you it probably won't be good, okay? And so that's the kind of thing that, that we wanna stop. Or if, it, if it's supposed to respond and it doesn't, well, that's, you, know, you can end up with a deadlock that way. So there's lots of nasty cases that can occur uh, and we'd like to prevent those from happening. Okay, so that's the goal of crossing guard. How does it do that? Well, again, like border control, we're gonna implement a, a small amount of hardware in the trusted host to ensure that whatever it does do, it's, whatever the accelerator does do, it's going to be safe. Okay, so we're gonna implement a simple standard interface. It's gotta be complex enough to allow for hierarchical protocols with uh, various optimizations. It's gotta work with a range of protocols. It's gotta maintain safety for the host. And of course, it's also gotta be compatible with border control protections and enforce those as well. Okay, the key idea here is we're gonna move the protocol complexity into the crossing guard hardware so, so that only that hardware has to deal with all that complex, that big scary table. It's gonna be implemented once per host system. It's gonna be designed by the, the host uh, expert team. So you're not going to say, oh, this accelerator team is going to do this. No, these are the guys that implemented the coherence protocol for Intel or AMD or whoever. Okay, so we talked about three goals that we wanted to meet. So the first goal was we wanted customizable caches and we have demonstrated, I'm not going to give you all the details here, but we've demonstrated that you can both support private per core L1s per accelerator. So this is showing three accelerators with each with a, uh, an L1 cache and a crossing guard uh, agent for each one, which is gonna ensure that each one is gonna talk correctly to the host directory and L2 cache along with the, the C, and so coexisting with the CPU. Or we can also do a much more complex two-level cache where there are private L1s and a shared L2 for the accelerator. So this kind of matches what most uh, GPUs do today. And again, there's a crossing guard agent that's gonna ensure that whatever it does when it talks to the green you know, host directory in L2, it's gonna do so correctly, okay? Rather than requiring the accelerator directory, uh, the accelerator uh, implementers to implement the big scary table correctly, they can get by with a much simpler uh, protocol implementation. So this is the, pro the complete protocol table for the single level accelerator cache. So there are five Five states, one of the B state is the only transient state in the protocol. Um, and if anybody has done protocols, you shall go ooh, because that's unheard of. Um, it's a very, very simple uh, uh, interface. Uh, that, this is focusing only at the interface between the accelerator, whatever it is, and the rest of the rest of the world. Um, we can come back to that question, but I gotta finish my talking very fast. So, uh, let's see, so uh, this, okay, so simple interface, so we also proven or demonstrated that, uh, we've also demonstrated that uh, this interface is sufficient to handle multiple different host protocols. We have implementations that work with an AMD hammer-like uh, exclusive MOSI protocol and a MESI inclusive protocol, so they're quite different uh, protocol implementations. Um, and shown that the host and accelerator protocols can, choices can be made independently. Um, and then for safety, we've uh, shown that uh, crossing guard is sufficient to 
guarantee that accelerator requests must be correct because we're checking them and we're checking them against the stable state and the transient state, um, uh, the stable, stable, uh, stable states and transient states of each block. And responses are also checked against the stable and transient states. And also there's a, temp there's a temporal responsiveness that's necessary. So if you're supposed to respond, you've got to do so in a reasonable amount of time or we're going to uh, take notice. Okay. And then uh, also uh, enforce the border control uh, protections. Okay. So just to summarize, uh, Crossing Guard provides a simple standardized interface uh, to ease accelerator development. It uh, guarantees correctness when the accelerator is correct. It provides host safety when the accelerator is incorrect. And I didn't show you any of the data, but you know, we show that there is you know, very low performance overhead. Um, so just to summarize my talk, you know, I think we all know that accelerators new, raise new security concerns and questions. Um, and what we've shown is that we can design secure interfaces to prevent bad memory accesses, to prevent coherence bugs, to ease accelerator development and do all of this at low overhead so somebody might actually want to use them. Okay, so I'm happy to take some questions, but I'll leave you with uh, the list of papers which sort of describe uh, crossing guard, border control, and then also a third paper which kind of talks about this threat model uh, and taxonomy for, for third party accelerators. So, if there are any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs>